It's good to see you once again this evening. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you are the speaking God, that you are the living and true God. Thank you that you've made us to image you in Jesus, that we might learn what it is to speak truth in love and to communicate in our marriages and our families. Tonight, as we speak on the subject of communication, we pray that your spirit would move in the midst of our hearts in conjunction with the ministry of your word, and that you would communicate to us, that you would speak to us, and that we would hear your voice in the scriptures, and that we would like you, learn to be good communicators. And we ask your mercies in these things through Christ. Amen. Well, last week we uh, overviewed the distinctive masculinity of the single man in Genesis chapter 2. And we found that one of the things that the man is entrusted with are words. And we saw that he was given creation words, the words whereby God defines and determines the function of all things, that he was given Sabbath words, the blessing and the sanctifying of the Sabbath, there in a sinless state, yet set apart unto the God who communes with his image, with his Son. And then we also saw the man being given the law words, that he received the commandment concerning the forbidden tree that was then to be communicated uh, to the woman. All of these things transpired prior to the woman's arrival. And so the assumption is that when she came on the scene that she would be instructed by her husband and that he would use words to give meaning to life. The definitions were already in place. And it was here that Satan precisely attacks the glory of God revealed in creation. He attacks at this matter of man's stewardship over God's words. And what he does is he, is he attacks the man's leadership that is exercised through his wife. And there's a responsibility of conveying the words of God. So, if she demonstrates an ineptitude in handling the words that were given to her from Adam, from God, then Satan is able to dislodge her from her place and collapse the entire created order and in so doing bring about death, which is a separation of the things that God put together. But now we live as fallen sinners in a world that has been plunged into death and deception. Now, God salvaged the original created order in Genesis chapter 3, but He also punished the creature with death. Not only the death that sees us returning to the dust, but also a death that is visited upon our relationships and our functions as males and females in this world. You remember the dominion mandate that was given in Genesis 1, uh, 26, 27, that outlines the, the uh, responsibilities of the couple, that mandate still regulates our lives even in a fallen and salvaged world. But death now has come to virtually every component of that mandate. Death now threatens our marriages. And the tension in the marriage is over the issue of leadership. It's over the issue of headship, the question of who will lead. And the challenge is to gain balance. Not to veer on the one hand to a dynamic of tyranny, tyrannical leadership by the man and, and an effacement, erasing of the dignity and integrity of the woman on the one hand. And then on the other hand, to the opposite extreme where the man totally abdicates his, re- his leadership and she usurps that. And so we have a twisting uh, to the other degree. So death threatens our marriage. Death threatens the woman for she experiences a unique kind of pain in the giving of birth. But 
at the same time, it, the sal- promise of salvation comes through the woman. And she, through her motherhood, will be the vehicle of the seed who will crush Satan's head. Of course, that seed is none other than Christ. And the crushing has been accomplished by His work on the cross and the resurrection. But death also threatens the man in his labor. And it's intriguing to to learn that the word that is used to describe the pain of the woman in childbirth is also used to describe a man's frustration in his labors as he works with a world that is now cursed, an earth that is cursed and reluctantly responds to his industry producing thorns and thistles and him sweating and getting precious little for it. Well, tonight we move on to the subject of marital communication. We're going to survey some highlight issues and see if we can meet with some challenges and encouragements to become good communicators. The first heading concerns the communication of gospel love. Now, as fallen sinners in a death-cursed world, Let me ask you, what is the most important thing that we must learn to communicate to one another? As fallen sinners in a death-cursed world, what's the most important thing that we must learn to communicate with each other? There are two instances that I remember. One is a young couple where Trish and I attended a Bible study when I was at a certain graduate school that was being conducted by some of our professors. And we were struggling and meeting with some things in one another that neither of us liked. And so I asked the question in this Bible study concerning what happens if you ever fight with your spouse. And the answer was evaded. And I said, well, what happens if you disagree? The answer was evaded. What about if you ever sin? in your relationship? And the answer again was evaded. And there was just this picture of this sort of idyllic, romantic, I mean, I heard like the violence in the background and it was just all sort of romantic and and almost fairy tale like And I remember leaving the the home that night and saying to my wife, you know, something just is not right here. Something just is not right. Because you're two sinners who are are living together. And, and, uh, you know, you're going to have struggles. Well, I later learned that that marriage was formed out of an adulterous context and that uh, just recently I I heard of the death of the of the man and he died lonely for because they had separated in their in their latter years. And I I remember the feeling coming out as a young man in, in the early months of my marriage and just convinced that there was they were not dealing with the most important issue. Then I remember another occasion sitting on the porch with a pastor friend of mine and his wife came and ministered refreshments to us and and then she left and was walking down this long porch uh, off to the side and I was looking at his face while she was walking away and the look of love was on his face and I said to I said to him I said brother you you really love that lady don't you and he just shook his head and looked down and he said God forgive me I've murdered her so many times in my heart And the two of us just started laughing. Because that's the truth. That's reality. In the first instance, the thing that was not being honestly dealt with was sin. And in the second instance, the thing that was immediately seen as the most grievous aspect of a very healthy and, and, and loving relationship, the most grievous thing is the heart sins. The realization that I'm capable of murdering in my heart the one that I most dearly love. The biggest threat to your marriage is your sin, each other's sin. And if you don't know how to address and resolve the inevitable eruption of sin, then your marriage will succumb to the punishment of the fall, which is death. Death is a result of sin. Therefore, you have to deal with sin. So as we turn our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, I want to encourage you, first of all, to develop a disposition of gospel love, a posture, an attitude. 
a disposition of gospel love. In Colossians chapter 3, and beginning at verse 12, So, as those who have been chosen by of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Because we have been forgiven, we have a heart that is eager to forgive. We're to be like God, as He's described in Psalm 86.5. For Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness unto all them that call upon Thee. Isaiah 30 and verse 8. Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore He waits on high to have compassion on you. There is to be within our hearts a bias, a prejudice, a, an inclination toward forgiveness, an eagerness to engage in gospel love. That also involves the forbearance of gospel love. You see that in verse 3, bearing, verse 13, bearing with one another. Why is it that we're called to bear with one another? Because in any relationship of intimacy, you are going to find occasions of offense. You're going to find things that annoy you. You're going to find things that irritate you. You're going to learn how to push her button. You're going to learn, she's going to learn how to push yours. And you have to be committed to forbear on those matters of annoyances and not provoke one another. First Peter 4, 8 reads, Love covers a multitude of sin. Forbearance seeks to cover a multitude of sin. But that leads us to consider the transaction of gospel love. At some point, forbearance is no longer possible. And the sin has become an issue which has to be addressed. What point is that? I would suggest to you it's when you begin to experience death. It's at the point when you begin to experience death. When you begin to realize that the irritant and the annoyance is causing an emotional separation. When the sin is causing an interpersonal death to the relationship. You've got sin. You've got death. And the only thing that's adequate to rectify sin and death is the gospel. So there must be a transaction of the gospel. There must be an exchange, as Paul says in verse 13, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. What Paul is saying is, on the occasion of the eruption of sin that cannot be covered in the blanket of love and forbearance, there has to be a forgiveness. There has to be this gospel transaction in the relationship that is a reenactment of what transpired between you and the Lord when He first forgave you. In the same way that the Lord has forgiven you, now you go and reenact that dynamic in the relationship into which sin has intruded. Imitate His gospel dealings with your spouse. Remember what happened when He, fa when he forgave you? When you were converted? You brought to Him your repentance of sin. You brought to Him your faith in Jesus Christ. And He entered into a transaction with you. He responded to you in mercy. And He forgave you on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And there was a transaction of the Gospel based upon the cross of Jesus Christ. We need to reenact that transaction. We need to enter into that transaction on the occasion of our sin. The sinner, therefore, needs to take responsibility for his sin. This is our expertise. This is what we're really good at. Some people, their religion teaches them to be really good at beating their backs bloody. Our religion teaches us to be really good at identifying sin and striving with the Gospel to overcome it. We are not only believers, we are repenters. And by repentance... 
That doesn't mean emoting. It means repenting. It means confessing the sin. The word means to say the same thing about the behavior, about the speech, about the attitude that God says about it. Repeat the same thing about it that God says about it. That's where we benefit from the Word of God. That's where the law is so helpful for us in defining sin. As John tells us, sin is lawlessness. And repentance involves an about face, a turning of 180 degrees at the point of that sin. So this is what the sinning party brings to the transaction. He brings confession. He brings an acknowledgement of wrongdoing. And he's not being evasive. And he's not blame shifting. And he's not dodging. He's saying, as we said when we came to Christ, I am the sinner. And I have sinned. And so he enters into the transaction seeking the gospel commodity of forgiveness and asks, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? It's a very shallow, unsatisfactory, unhealing thing for someone to come and confess their sin but never obtain forgiveness. And sometimes we don't obtain it because we don't ask for it. And we don't, we don't, we don't obligate the other person to enter into the transaction. I'm coming to you to confess my sin in repentance and I want you to forgive me. I want to receive back from you this bestowal of forgiveness. And again, not sentiment. Sometimes these things just evaporate into emoting and feelings. But there is to be a bestowal of forgiveness in which there is a conscious application of the blood of Jesus Christ, a conscious affirmation that our sin that has been confessed has been duly punished and made atonement for in the blood of Jesus Christ. And on the basis of the work of Christ, the forgiver can now make promises, as God did to you. Promises that are given by faith and obedience to Jesus Christ. I believe this is what... Jesus is calling to in Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and verse 4, where he says, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times a day saying, I repent, forgive him. This is somebody you live with seven times a day. This is someone you're close to. Jesus wants us to be on our guard. He wants us to deal with issues of sin. Love is going to speak to those issues. And the one who is rebuked, if he repents, it's one thing to have the disposition of gospel love. It's another thing to have the transaction of gospel love. I may have the posture of being ready to forgive, being eager to forgive, and have a prayerful, Father, forgive them. He doesn't know what they're doing. Disposition in my heart. But until there's a transaction in the relationship, the relationship experiences death. It experiences the separation that sin brings into the relationship. So Jesus is saying, look, here comes a man, maybe seven times a day, and he's asking you to sit down at the table and enter into a transaction. He says, I bring my repentance. Jesus says, now you sit down at the table and you give him your forgiveness. You give him forgiveness. In Ephesians chapter 4, at the very end of chapter 4 on into chapter 5, Paul speaks to this matter of the obligation that we have to forgive one another. Be kind to one another, verse 32. Tenderhearted, forgiving each other. Again, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitate God. Do to each other what God did to you. Show the same sort of response to the eruption of sin that God showed to you in the eruption of your sin. 
How does God respond when we confess our sin to Him? He takes legal action based upon the work of Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, knowing there that His wrath is propitiated, punishment is duly met met out, the blood of Christ makes atonement. On the basis of that legal action, He then makes promises of covenant commitment. Promises of grace to the believing confessor. So we forgive. And we give, therefore, not our love, but we give the love that we've received from the Father to our brother, our sister. We give the love that the Father has for us because our love is not the stuff of which forgiveness is made. Christ is the love of God. And it's His love that must be forgiven in order to overcome sin. So we don't get that love from our parents, necessarily. We don't get that love from our gene pool. We don't get that love from any other place except the cross. That's where this love comes from. And we must learn to define each other in our marriages, in our families, in our church, We must learn to define each other in terms of our relationship to Jesus Christ, not in terms of our relationship to sin. So we make promises. We promise not to define the other person. Once we've entered into this this transaction, we're making a promise. I'm not going to see you now united to your sin. That's forgiven. I'm going to see you united to Jesus Christ. You're going to remind me of Christ now as opposed to reminding me of your sin. Therefore, I make a promise. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to ruminate over it. Like one pastor said, it's like, you know, those intrusive advertisements on your Internet. All of a sudden, boom, you got something in front of you that pops up. You just click, you just hit the delete. You don't entertain it. You don't go searching on it. You hit the delete. It's not going to take a place. I'm not going to let it ruminate in my mind. God, God of course... That knows everything. But it says he puts our sin out of his mind. Forget how can God forget? He says he forgets our sin. How can he forget? What he's doing is he's intentionally, purposely not defining us in relation to our sin. He's defining us in relation to Christ. We must promise not to remind our spouse about that sin. And not to inform others about that sin. Now it may be in order to mature, to grow, there may be, without the heat, without the offense, there may be reason to revisit the occasion of the sin in order to derive lessons, but not in order to reenact the offense. The offense has been taken care of. And also, we promise to encourage the fruit of repentance and to re- promote the resurrection victory of the restored relationship. A, a restored relationship, particularly the marriage relationship, ought to become more and more vital, more and more living as the gospel is injected more and more frequently into the life of the relationship. Because if there's someone that you're going to sin against seven times a day, it'll be your spouse. And if there's, an, if there, if there's anything that's, that's more soul bonding than the discovery of the power of the gospel to teach us to love each other, I don't know what it is. There's a reconnection. The, the illustration of the zipper, some of you have known, I've used this before, the sin separates and, 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 and takes and brings the coat apart. Then in Christ, the bottom teeth are joined together again. And then we, we bring the relationship back up again. And we've learned some things about one another. We've learned our vulnerabilities. We've learned our weaknesses. But in love, we're learning to overcome and to protect and to heal and to nurture. And as a result of that, the relationship is something we've invested into. And it becomes precious to us. It becomes valuable to us. And as the years pass and we realize, you know, the Lord has taught us some things. And the love that we have has been hard bought. And it's, it's precious. And, it's, and, and, and we've attained a level of knowledge and intimacy with one another, sometimes in painful ways. But nonetheless, through the power of the gospel, and we want our relationship to be protected and it becomes valuable to us, it becomes that much more precious when we learn to communicate gospel love. Secondly, 
We have to communicate verbally and emotionally. Just because we have technology and means of communication doesn't mean that we communicate. I'm not all that great uh, much of a fan about, you know, sitting down and watching TV together as, you know, there's quality time of communicating. You know, we're driving down the road and everybody's got their own individual iPods in. You know, have you ever done that? You know, son, I want to... Son, I want to... Get those things out of his ears for a moment so I can talk to him, right? Just, you know, because we have the communication techniques, it doesn't mean that we're communicating. You know, I, I uh, you know, the idea when I'm talking to somebody and they're texting somebody else, and they, I go into a different mode of communication at that point. Let me submit to you, gentlemen, that we... I'm reminding you of Genesis 2 and the stewardship of words. That in this matter of communicating verbally and emotionally, we are biblically held most responsible for these dynamics in our marriages and in our homes. We are the steward of words. We are the speakers. We are the definers in Genesis chapter 2. We've been given creation words. We've been given Sabbath words. We've been given law words, and we just saw and reiterate that we've been given gospel words. Our Bibles are open to Ephesians. Look at chapter 5, verse 26. So he might sanctify her. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And the word there in the Greek is rhema. It's the word that we get, the English word rhetoric. It's the idea uh, not of written words, which is grammar. You get, you know, grammatical. It's, it's not the concept of the message or the, the word in the sense of a communicated word, logos. But this is rhema. This is a rhetoric. This is a spoken word. This is speech. The man is responsible to speak. Women are attracted to words. As I get older and uglier, I'm thankful for that. My biceps have become bi-biceps. Never had any money for it to fly away, but oftentimes when you look at a really handsome, a really beautiful woman with a really gnarly little guy, you say to yourself, too, he can really talk. Or he's got a lot of money. Right? And actually, and you, you, that's uh, speech. And she's, she's, commu- she is a, she's attracted to your ability to use words to make her feel secure. Because when you, by your leadership, communicate truth and love, when you, by your leadership, are able to show her that you know the meaning of life and you're secure in that, and you lead her in that, she feels secure by the leadership you give through your words. You have to speak, gentlemen. It's amazing that uh, there's so many things that go into making us silent bricks. And it's because we tend to sin. We have to overcome that with the power of the Spirit. We need to regulate and monitor the words that are spoken in the home. We need to be the thermometer in the home. We need to set the verbal temperature. We need to determine that there'll be more singing than arguing, that there'll be more polite courtesy than peevish nitpicking, that there'll be more encouraging words home, home on the plane, not critical. And we need to monitor that. We need to listen to what's being said between uh, our wives and our children and our, our children and children. And we need, to, we need to be those who monitor words. And we need to insist on gospel words, gospel rhetoric in our meals, praying in our family worship, constantly bringing issues to prayer. Before the kids go someplace, let's pray. When they've done something, let's let's give God thanks. Let's pray. When there's a need, there's a concern in a relationship, well, let's pray about it. And there needs to be gospel transactions in the home so that the children learn and that there is all these sinners living together. They learn how to deal with sin, and we need to lead them in that. A statement made once long ago is still very true. If we're not Christians in our home, we're not Christians. That's where our Christianity 
is most evident in the relationships in which we're most ourselves. So if we're Christians, we're going to be most ourselves in the context of those relationships. Those are the relationships that we want to have the gospel triumph. So there's gospel words. And secondly, there are affectionate words. Again, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. So husbands ought to also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, for we are members of his body. In previous times when I've taught this material and I've gotten sometimes a response saying, you, you know, you talk about that, you know, that man confessing that he murders his wife in his heart. That's a little bit harsh, isn't it? I mean, that's, you know, that's going a little bit extreme, isn't it? No. Because Paul tells me right here that my, my liability in my sin is to hate my own flesh. My one flesh. And the essence of murder is hatred. So, when I'm trafficking in the Sixth Commandment as a temptation in marriage, I'm trafficking in biblical material. The opposite of hatred here is nourish. To develop, to maturity, to bring it to a fruitfulness. And to cherish. In the Greek, it means to warm it up, to make it soft. To warm it up, to make it soft. It speaks of cultivating affection. Willard Harley, in his book, His Needs, Her Needs, places sex as the first need of the husband and affection as the first need of the wife. This is a counselor of, uh, of some Christian perspective. Men need to realize this need in their wives. Harley says on page 34, women find affection important in its own right. They love feeling, though they love the feeling that accompanies both the bestowal and the reception of affection, but it has nothing to do with sex. Most of the affection they give and receive is not intended to be sexual. This confuses the typical male. He sees showing affection as part of sexual foreplay. We need to understand that about our wives. On the other hand, our wives need to understand that the demonstration of affection that doesn't lead to sexual intimacy feels like self-denial to the husband. But we need to cherish the wife because she needs to be cherished. Not because we are on the hunt and affection is the automatic precursor to physical intimacy. Harley suggests, and I have to list the things he suggests because I need to learn about this, hugs and greeting cards and flowers and dinner out and opening the door and holding her hand and walks after dinner and back rubs and phone calls and conversations with loving expressions, which basically means romance her. It's a challenge. I remember getting a, an email with two metal boxes. The one with this electronic control board with all these dials and knobs and gauges and sensor lights and flips and switches. And underneath it said, this is the female mechanism. And then another one, this simple little sterile box with a single on and off switch that here's the male. Not too complicated. Now, although demonstrations of affection are not sexual foreplay per se, there is a relationship between these two foremost needs of the man and the woman. Harley goes on to say, when your marriage is struggling sexually, look for the missing element of affection. Without the environment, the sexual event is contrived and unnatural for many women. All too often, she reluctantly agrees to have sex with her husband, even though she knows she won't enjoy it. Without affection, the woman's sexual experience is incomplete. Affection is the environment of the marriage, while sex is an event. He goes on to say that most affairs start because of the lack of affection for the wife and a lack of sex for the husband. So the marriage deteriorates into a vicious cycle of no affection, no sex, which leads to no desire to show affection, which leads to deterioration in the intimacy, where he says that these two primary needs begin to suffer. Which brings us then to speak not only of communicating verbally and emotionally, but communicating Sexually. 
Indeed, sexual intimacy is pictured as the epitome of creation beauty in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, where the man and his wife are naked and are unashamed. The issue of their sexual intimacy also lay at the crux of the fall. For upon discovery of sin and the realization of death, the first thing they do is put fig leaves on themselves. Not over their eyes or over their ears, but over their sexual organs. And they are estranged sexually. It is a very significant component of what we are in our humanness and especially in our marriage. We need to have God's perspective on our sexuality and our sexual life. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, we read, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. The word translated marriage bed, you may have in your translation, marriage is in italics, and the word bed is what is used. Actually, the word is the word koite in the Greek. We get the English word coitus, which is the word used for sexual intercourse. God is speaking here of that which is the emblem, the core emblem of the one flesh relationship in the sexual intimacy. And he says that it is to be held in honor and it is to be undefiled. It is a word undefiled that relates to ceremonial cleanliness of the sanctuary and temple and of moral Purity. It is without stain. It is without corruption. It is something which is sanctified. Never think of God being present with you in those times of intimacy. You should realize that He is and that He delights in it. That He looks upon that as part of what He created as very good. And part of what he sees as pointing to the love that his son has for his bride, for his church. God delights in it. It's holy. It's honorable. It's sanctified. God's provision is also given to us, not only his perspective, but his provision in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Those of you with discernment realize that each one of these points is an actual sermon in previous ministries. In 1 Corinthians 7, reading from verse 2 to verse 5, because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, we obviously immediately recognize Paul's discreet vocabulary. To have his own wife. To have her own husband. To fulfill his duty. To come together again. To stop depriving. We know that he's talking about the issues of sexual intimacy. That's the whole context in the larger setting of chapter 6 where these men are thinking that being a Christian gives them liberty to visit temple prostitutes. And Paul is saying, no, God has made a provision in your wife. If a couple are not regularly communicating with physical intimacy, Paul says they render their marriage vulnerable to an assault from Satan. In this day of heightened sexual stimuli, there's more sexual stimuli for a man to contend with today than ever in this culture. And there are other cultures or it's even more provocative in Europe 
your daily newspapers have full front page, you know, full frontal nudity, a full page spread. I remember standing in a in the tube in London and going to the airport and just just standing and and just you know looking around and this in this guy and I was you know I didn't want him to turn the page because I was reading the newspaper over his shoulder and I was looking at the you know the headline and they're getting getting what was going on in the country and he turns the page and here's this full full page and it's in the, it's in the public newspaper you you travel in Italy and there are posters billboards and they just they strike you with with the glaring uh, sexual stimuli and our nation is becoming more and more open to these kinds of things with demolished sexual mores it scares me when I get in, interaction and feedback from young people even professed Christians to discover how unguarded they are against fornication how prevalent this sin is we need to honor the marriage bed. And as Christian couples who understand our sexuality biblically, we need to frequent it according to our mutual needs and rights of both spouses. You need to understand, in Paul's day, for him to say that a wife has the, the ownership of a husband in these things was just, was just radical. It was radical. Because she had no rights in such things. If he was going to do what he was going to do, he would go off and do it, whatever. She had no claim on him. And for him to make this assertion is to place a woman in a place of tremendous significance, countercultural to say the least. Well, seeing these things of communication of the gospel, verbal, emotional, sexual, this brings me to say that I am married to my wife and sister. Fourthly, I am married to my wife and sister. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. I'm married to my wife. First Peter 3, 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman. Now, there my wife is, def- there, there, there Trish is defined for me as my wife. Peter views her and defines her in terms of creation in the fall. In terms of that orb of life, she is my wife. And I am to live with her. I am to cohabit with her. That means I spend time with her. It's not good for the man to be alone. No small part of the marriage relationship is given so to provide companionship. It is not good for us to socialize separately. We are to be together We need to beware of having busy lifestyles that foster a husband and wife going in a separate way and just spending a lot of time separated. We're to live together. In the Greek, it means be in the same place at the same time for a period of time. I understand that there are mitigating things. My conscience just came in and goes, click, you're leaving tomorrow for a week, you know. I mean, there are, yeah, there's responsibilities in the job and so forth and so on. And, and you know, there are military duty and, and all kinds of reasons for, for prolonged separation. But all of that notwithstanding, this is what the Scripture says. We need to spend time. We need to live with her in an understanding way. We get the English word science from the word that is used here. We need to study her, observe her, know her, nurture her. I'm not married to marriage. I'm married to a particular woman. What all I know about marriage is one thing. I need to know my wife. I need to know her in an understanding way. Peter says she's a weaker vessel. She's a woman. That's who she is according to creation. Vessel is a word describing her physical body, which is comparatively, generally, usually, not always, but usually weaker than the man. There are some scary ladies out there, but generally, the lady is weaker than the man. The second half of the verse, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, Peter moves to viewing my spouse in light of eternity. She's the grace of 
she is an heir to the grace of life. Now I'm looking at her in relation to eternity. And in this relationship, she's my sister. I'm to grant her honor, to tribute value and worth to her as my sister. She's a fellow heir of the grace of life. She's equally saved as I am, equally justified, equally adopted, equally sanctified, has received gifts and is graced with salvation. Therefore, as my sister, she has the right to come to me and open up my Bible and say to me, Brother, this is what the Scripture says. And this is what we're called to as brother and sister in Christ. She has a platform, a pulpit. She has a place in our marriage to address my conscience. She's not being insubordinate when she addresses me as my sister. For she is a fellow heir of the grace of life. And Peter says, this is so that your prayers will not be hindered. You can't worship Christ. Your worship is will your worship will be affected by your relationship to your wife. You begin to pray, you come into worship, and your relationship with your wife is not right. Jesus says, in effect, hey pal, how's the missus? Before we get going here, before we start praying, before we start to worship, how's things with the wife? When was the last time you prayed together as a couple? For your marriage? For your kids? For the church? For the issues of the kingdom? Praying together. Praying together. Your prayers will not be hindered. I'm married to my wife and my sister. And lastly, until death do us part. In 1 Peter 3.7, the first half of the verse concerns the relationship that I have to Trish in time, in terms of creation. The second half of the verse concerns my relationship to Trish as a fellow heir of life in terms of eternity. These two halves of the verse speak of my relationship to her in time and my relationship to her in eternity. And in between those two halves, there's an event that transpires. And what is it? Death. Death. It's the great separator. And many of us included in our vows that phrase, until death do us part. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 25, Jesus speaks to the issues of marriage in the age to come. In Mark 12 and verse 25, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So we won't be married in the new heavens and the new earth. By then our marriage will have fulfilled God's purposes for us. Instead of being married one to another, husband and wife, we will be united to Christ as His bride. The significance of our marriage will be elevated and brought to its consummated fulfillment in its eschatological significance while we then become part of a glorified society of saints who live together in a perfect sinless love of more intimacy and more knowledge and more, and more love than, than any of us will ever experience in the best of, of, of marriages this side of the resurrection. Next time you're walking through New York City, think about being in a city where everybody you see, you love them and they love you and you know each other with a greater depth of love and intimacy than what you have in the experience of your own spouse. I, we will not be married then. But I have reason to believe I'll know her. I'll know her as my sister in Christ. And together we'll praise Christ for having given each other to each other and having taught us in our marriage to love each other with gospel love so that our marriages, by the gift of the Spirit, prepare us for eternal love. So we end this three-part series on marriage back at the place where it begins. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I encourage you to sit in front of this verse, use sanctified imagination, and ponder the picture. Look at it. It is one of the most profound verses in the entire Bible. It is a window 
into the significance of creation and redemption. Paul picks this verse up, the only place in the New Testament in Ephesians 5.31 where this verse is cited again. And Paul says, this is a depiction not only of creation but of redemption. This is a picture of Jesus and his church. And he stands back and he says, this mystery is great. This is a picture of what we are created in God's image. This is a picture of what God has given to us to enjoy in gospel intimacy. This is a picture of of what we are destined to be in union with Jesus Christ. See this picture. It is a profound demonstration of Christ and His love for us. And as you look at this picture and perceive the the profound significance and the prophetic significance, embrace your spouse. Do so as an expression of your love for Jesus Christ. And even though death looms near upon all of us. Embrace your spouse and see the resurrection of Christ. See the triumph of Christ's resurrection and look at this resurrected Savior and see His love for us and embrace your spouse and say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.